Hello, everyone. Welcome again to FreightWave TV and the Transmission Show. My name is Sebastian Blanco. Over there is my co-host, Grace Sharkey. Grace, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. You know, it's been a crazy week for supply chain. I think we've had four unicorns across the world this week, including Thailand's first. And then our friends over at AIT actually just acquired uh, Multimodal uh, International on Thursday. So what's really great about that is they are a customs broker for a lot of industrial manufacturers, including automotive. So um, I'm excited to, to continue that train of thought, literally, in, into this discussion. <laughs> Yeah, it, it has, has been a crazy week. I saw the headline about the one in Thailand, and it's, you know, it's, it's it, we can barely keep up. Right. Um, but we'll, we'll do what we can today, right after we hear from our sponsor, which, you know, uh, as you mentioned, is uh, AIT. When you switch to AIT Worldwide Logistics for automotive shipping, you're partnering with a team of logistics professionals in Asia, Europe, and North America who develop customized supply chain solutions that are just as unique as your business, whether it's transborder, hotshot trucking, express ocean service or an exclusive air charter, AIT has the expertise, technology, and carrier connections to achieve your production goals every time. Check out their link in the show notes. All right. Yeah, it has, it has been a crazy week in a lot of ways. For me, the craziness has been uh, full of Toyota stuff. I'm here in Plano, Texas. Uh, it's been three, four days full of product pieces, uh, what Toyota calls Teammate, which is their sort of, you know, driving assistance slightly uh, self-driving technology. Uh, but that is why I wanted to have uh, someone from Toyota here. And we're lucky to have Robert Young, Executive Vice President um, in the purchasing supplier development side of things for Toyota Motor North America. And Robert, thank you for joining us today. Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm honored to join you. Thank you very much. Well, as I said, this this event has been full of, of things that I've learned, but people don't always want to hear this, the information coming from me. They want to hear from our experts. So I wanted to start with um, a quote that the Toyota Motor North America Senior Vice President of Sales, Bob Carter, gave when he gave his presentation here. And he was talking about uh, last month's sales, which, as we all know, sales and demand is very high right now for new vehicles. At the start of May, Toyota had about 115,000 cars in its inventory. When you calculate it out, it's about a 13-day supply because you ended up selling 242,000 new cars last month. So I just wanted to start with, in general, as you're navigating the current situation with the various shortages, the various supply challenges, how do you go from building that many cars in, you know, just in time to get them not only, you know, produced, but then to dealerships and then out the door? Yeah, well, Sebastian, you know, really the, the last, you know, 12 months plus has, has been extremely challenging throughout the entire industry. And, you know, we've been working um, very uh, collaboratively and uh, with our supplier partners to try to ensure that we can, you know, sustain our production plans here in North America to meet uh, overall customer demand. And as you said, the overall market in North America is extremely hot right now. Um, and uh, there are a lot of headwinds when it comes to the overall supply chain and our ability uh, to be able to uh, produce enough vehicles for um, our customers. Good thing is that, you know, the, the manufacturing team, our entire supply team, uh, I think we're really doing a good job trying to maximize production so that even though we have low inventory in the field, we've got enough throughput going out to our dealer partners to be able to uh, support uh, customer demand right now. I know the the RAV4 Prime is one of the vehicles that's in very short supply. What can you tell us about which vehicles, you know, production plants are focusing on versus maybe, well, there's not as much demand for this one, so we'll shift our resources over to these other models. How does that, you know, split look right now? Yeah, well, right now, it, it, of course, some vehicles are a little bit hotter than others, but I think for the most part, the entire market is is up. And, um, you know, we're really trying to boost production um, across the board, all of our vehicles. So we really don't have the ability to, to play off resources from vehicle A to vehicle B as it stands right now. Uh, but we are, uh, again, working through the many headwinds that we've faced over the last 12 months and, um, you know, trying to maximize production as best we can. You know, it truly has been an unbelievable year as far as, you know, last year trying to learn how to safely uh, manufacture during a pandemic, 
both Toyota and our supplier partners. It was unbelievable how the entire industry came together and shared best practices and got us back up and running. But since then, you know, we've had tornadoes, we've had plant fires, we've had port delays, you name it. Now we have a semiconductor related issue and sprinkle in the Texas weather event uh, earlier this year. And uh, we've had numerous challenges, but uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job trying to uh, overcome those. Is there, uh, you mentioned that you had to really change things up for the pandemic, right? Is there any lessons that you took from that that are really sticking and going to stay in effect in order to stay resilient for things, weather related issues that you just listed off that right. um, are, are happening more frequently than a, a worldwide pandemic? Right. I would say, you know, kind of lessons learned twofold. One is how we collaborate. Um, internally and with our supplier partners, we've been able to adopt virtual tools. And so, the, you know, we pride ourselves on Go and See and Genshi Gambutsu and supporting our suppliers on the shop floor. You know, we've been able to support and do it all virtually. And uh, so it means that we can really get our subject matter experts really to the point of problems to quickly problem solve. So that's a, a great lesson learned that we're going to continue moving forward, give us a lot more flexibility from a supply chain standpoint. You know, there's some events you really can't protect against. Uh, but in general, you know, as a say, semiconductor uh, supply and demand issue that we have right now, I, I think the entire industry, we will all modify our business practices on how we issue releases, the duration of releases, the commitments as they go through the supply chain to the semiconductor manufacturers to try to ensure that we can, you know, guarantee supply moving forward. You know, we give our suppliers, you know, three years notice um, or forecast a viewpoint of what we're going to need. Um, but, you know, as it goes down through the tiers, I think it loses some of its uh maybe transparency or credibility. Um, so I think uh, clearly the entire industry will, will shore that up quickly and uh, behind the scenes, the, the automakers uh, and the, the major tier one suppliers and the semiconductor uh, industry are all having dialogue about what does that look like? So there will be changes. You hinted at this with the discussion of, you know, being transparent. Um, I, another topic I wanted to bring up was, it should be no surprise to you, but Every year, Plant Moran does sort of an index as far as how automakers mm. and their suppliers, the relationship between the two. And I think it's for the last 10 years, Toyota has been the number one uh, on that ranking. Honda has been number two all this time. And other OEMs kind of fuck you way up and down uh, b below that. You know, that kind of thing doesn't happen by accident. So I just kind of wanted to ask you, you know, what kind of things do you and, and your team and the Toyota, you know, everyone at Toyota, how do you manage those relationships? And then, you know, we'll get into some electric vehicle stuff in a second, but let's just start with overview. How, do, how does sure. Toyota think about the, those interactions with suppliers? And you said there's a three-year sort of preview that you give to, give to them, but what else are you doing to really make that relationship work? Yeah, I, I think, you know, fundamentally, um, and, and Toyota's not so much different than other automakers, but I think clearly uh, as a company, you know, we look at our supplier partners as, as true partners. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, they represent 70% of our cost structure, well over 50% of the innovation that goes into our vehicles. Um, we need them in many cases more than they need us. And so we have to uh, try to be the, you know, kind of customer of choice. And, and the way we try to go about that is through, um, trying to build you know long-term mutually beneficial relationships and you know you mentioned that we've we've had some consistency at least from a rating standpoint and i would you know say that in general our business practices don't change you know the way we handle raw material inflation and the way we engage with problem solving that it doesn't change and at the end of the day you know, it's ingrained in our culture that we need to treat, you know, our suppliers as true partners, treat them with respect. There's the right way to have an argument. There's the right way to solve a problem. But, you know, at the end of the day, our suppliers have to be sustainable. They have to be able to make money. They have to be able to reinvest. And so we're really spending a lot of time and effort focused on, and I'll just cover two areas. One is foundationally, how do we continue to build our and strengthen our foundation when it comes to overall operational capability. 
right? And you know, we have the Toyota production system. We are trying to educate all of our supplier partners on the Toyota production system. You can call it lean manufacturing, but at the end of the day, the nuts and bolts, the blocking and tackling is how well you can execute. And so we're trying to work with our supplier partners every day to try to improve overall execution. Um, and that's what we do internally. So what we're doing internally, you know, is the same expectation uh, to our supplier partners. I think it makes them better for not just for Toyota. It makes them better for their other customers as well. And we're good with that. That's no problem. Um, so, you know, we try to work um, and, and strengthen the foundation. The second piece is trying to pull our suppliers earlier into the development process. And so you know, typically the old style is you, you know, you develop project by project. And of course at Toyota, we do, 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 do that, but we also take it back upstream and we're looking at what are the optimal commodity solutions for 24, 25, 26 today and working with our suppliers early so that we can optimize it and we can come up with solutions that are great for our end customer, but good for our supplier as well and good for us. Right. But that extra effort and that early engagement really allows us to, to really take advantage of the synergies between manufacturing innovation and design innovation. They're no longer in silos. And so that's, you know, another aspect of what we try to do with our supplier partners. And I wanted to, to get a little more detail. It sounds like I, I think I can kind of guess what your answer is going to be based on what you just said. But one of the things we try to focus on here on the show is the shift towards electrification. And so is there. Do you do you have any examples in that you can point to that the way that you're dealing with some of these new suppliers, I mean, where do you get your cells? How do you make your batteries? How do you, you know, that you're treating these these um, suppliers in any way that's different than you would to make a ICE vehicle? Or is the, the methodology pretty much the same no matter what kind of powertrain vehicle you're building? Uh, the methodology is the same. Quite frankly, I mean, it's it's the exact same. We still, you know, if you think about battery packs, battery cells, uh, production, huge, huge investments, right? Nobody's going to make the investment unless they feel confident that we can be long-term partners together. So we're, we're taking the exact same approach. And in other areas of mobility space that we're dabbling in, whether it's Joby Aviation, we're trying to take that same mindset and collabor collaborative approach uh, to different industries. I think some people are looking at us like, really? <laughs> this doesn't make sense. We've never heard of doing it that way. But I, I think at the end of the day, so, you know, people start to learn that, you know, hey, we have their best interests at heart. We need them to be successful and we can learn from each other. And so why not approach it that way? So we'll see. I mean, that's our, that's Sebastian. That's our, our game plan. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and I, we feel pretty confident that it'll, it'll be successful. It sounds like a, a main um, uh, a main way that you're, you're handling this is through transparency. And you brought it up earlier that you know as you start to get into the the lower tiers, that is sometimes that might um, the the message might change. Which uh, telephone, right? Same same situation there. Uh, what I'm finding is a lot of, of companies are investing in technology, right, to create this. Uh, really transparent environment between their suppliers so that everyone knows, okay, this is where we hope to be in the future. This is what we need from you now. And, and they just know their role in every, in every step of that chain. Uh, is there, do you feel like your company is focusing on that, that technology piece to intertwine all of your suppliers to, to keep them well informed? Yeah, you know, our logistics network, I, I think we use those types of technologies when it comes to kind of direct parts of materials or the components that go into our vehicles. We haven't deployed that type of uh, technology. And I think still, you know, what we're pondering is as you go through the chain, each link has to make their own business decisions. And so it's not necessarily really what's best for Toyota. They've got to consolidate all of their customers. So that's kind of one of the challenges that, that we have. I, I, I think over time we will get to a point where there's greater transparency for some 
critical commodities or items where maybe we've sourced a tier one supplier to do kind of a major sub assembly, but we've sourced the sub tier, you know, we'll, we have direct links to the sub tier. But in cases where the tier one supplier manages their overall supply chain, you know, we allow them to make the right business decisions. Um, sometimes maybe we, we want a little bit more transparency, but as of right now, uh, that that's the way we're operating. But I, I think that the tools are really exciting and um, I, you know, I, my guess is that five years or a decade from now, we'll, we'll be uh, uh, using those types of tools. But as of right now, no. One of the, the for me, most interesting uh, vehicles that was here at the, at the, in, in Plano this week was the, the BZ4X. I know it didn't debut here. We, uh, Toyota showed it off at the Shanghai Motor Show at, uh, in April, I think like maybe six or so weeks ago. Um, but this is its North American or U.S. debut. And, you know, this is a vehicle that's going to be built and sold in the U.S., I think, uh, mid-2022 or something, if I, if I remember correctly. There's a lot of information flowing around, so we'll see if that's accurate. But um, has Toyota said where that one's going to be built? Is that, will that be built in the U.S. or will that be built in Japan or do you not know yet? Uh, I, I believe it was announced that it'll be built in Japan, uh, but, but we will sell it from next year in the North American market. The, I saw a, um, a, a white paper this week put out by Global Bu Business Intelligence that really talked about the ways that the shift towards electrification is also really changing the supplier network. Now, you talked earlier about how the methodology is the same, the way that you treat suppliers and interact with them, which makes total sense. Um, but you are needing to find different parts. And so the, the paper, one of the, the points that it made was that, you know, a, an automaker might want to get multiple people to who could potentially provide uh, battery chemistry components or cells or you know, packs or modules depending on how that OEM you know builds its, its, its pack um, what what can you tell me hmm. not so much the way that the relationships work like we talked about earlier but just the different things that you that Toyota needs to figure out how to source in order to build electric vehicles yeah, well, I, I think that, you know, Sebastian, you know, we're leveraging, uh, uh, I don't know how many, 20 years of experience roughly with the hybrid uh, technology, right? So, you know, a, a, a BEV is, yeah, a, BV, a BEV though is, you know, it's hybrid on steroids. So we, we have a lot of experience with the type of materials, components that, that go into a BEV system. Um, so, and we have many partners, you know, we've been to, again, developing, you know, generation after generation of these solutions. So again, to a BEV is a little bit more complicated. It's much larger, um, in scale. Uh, but I, I think our, our general approach, you know, w remains the same. Um, you know, one of the challenges of course, is how do you secure, you know, the necessary raw materials that, that you need going forward as we make this transition. You know, I can't talk about our, our supply chain or commitments that we have out there, but I can tell you that, you know, Toyota is very proactive um, and, and we have teams that are looking out 20, 30 years of what type of materials we need, how we secure that supply, either through investment or contracts, whatever it might be. So, um, you know, I th you think uh, we're, we're ready for this trans transformation. Um, for for a, a part of the industry that's moving as quickly as electric vehicles is, I mean, how, how does a 30 year timeline even work with electric vehicles? I mean, when, you, when you're always building gas engines, it, there's a little bit more stability there. So that kind of makes sense. But with, with I know Toyota's, you know, working on things like solid state batteries, but I mean, who can even imagine what's going to be, what it's going to look like in, in three decades? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we, we, we try. <laughs> and I've actually joined meetings where we have our, our engineers, our advanced development folks. I mean, yes, it is do you have full accuracy? No, you don't. But we have some general idea directionally where the industry is headed and what types of technologies um, and solutions are going to be necessary. And so, you know, we begin to invest um, either in mining operations or um you know, trying to ensure that we have access uh, to, to those types of materials as we look <laughs> out to the future. So it's not perfect, right? But um, I, I think that we're proactive in our approach. Do you think because of your, your long hybrid history that you already have a lot of those investments already in place and that's what's really creating this ease maybe in your mind into this space? Or um, I guess what do you... How do you feel Toyota um, compares to its competitors 
and being prepared for these these shifts in technology for the future? That that's a good question. Um, and, and quite frankly, I can't, I can't speak to you know where our our competitors are at, but I, I can speak to we have a lot of experience with with batteries. Um, we have a lot of right. So I mean, as <laughs> yeah. So I mean, but I mean, as a, as a result of that, um, I, I think that you know we're in a position where we can scale. Um, you know, our solutions on, on a global basis, though, as I mentioned, you know, earlier, it, it's huge investment, right? And so, you know, we're trying to look at it from a standpoint of where are the, where's the market going to be? And is it North America? Is it China? Is it, you know, all, all of them, the BEV is going to grow, they're going to grow at, at different rates. And it depends in some cases on government policy. And so as, as a result, you know, we're trying to model out, you know, where do we need this type of capacity and then start to introduce that capacity. So at least initially, as we talked, you know, the, the, the BZ4X will be produced in Japan initially. You know, if the volume continues to grow in the North American market, it's, it's highly likely that, you know, we get to the second half of this decade, you know, we'll be producing the battery packs uh, here in North America. But it's all going to be dependent on market acceptance and volume, you know, because um, it, it's, it's just unwise for us to, you know, put in capacity where it's not immediately needed. We've got time for uh, one more question before uh, our show's up, but the idea that you're looking that far ahead and you know it it sounds like what if you're thinking maybe you know you'll build the bz4x in the us at some point so there is some flexibility built into into your models but how much you know if if something well maybe, maybe toyota has decided that these these sort of technologies won't change that dramatically but how much flexibility do you feel that you have should either technologies advance quickly and maybe in a way that toyota didn't see coming or does Toyota really feel like you've analyzed all of the all of the possible situations, and either the most likely or the ones that you really see are going to happen? Those are the ones you've locked in, and so you really doubt there will be any sort of surprise, you know, coming in the in the EV field that you won't be ready for. Well, I I, I don't think we know exactly what the future holds, but um, I, I will say that, especially from a powertrain standpoint. You know, we have a very strong portfolio. And so we have the capability for fuel cell vehicles, right? We have hybrid vehicles, plug-in hybrid vehicles, BEV uh, is, is around the corner. We are already producing them in Japan. Um, so from our standpoint, I think we're fortunate that we have the resources and capability to play in all of the known spaces. Um, and we have the resources also to scale up depending on how what market acceptance looks like. And, and that scale up, of course, it does take some time, but the market doesn't move that quickly, um, thankfully, because everybody else has to do the same thing and scale up. So that being said, I think I think we're, we're in a, a pretty good position to be able to adjust, and, and fortunately, we have the resources to do it right now. Excellent. Well, yeah, the, the proof is in the pudding. Like I said, the, the, the one study had Toyota at the top of the list with its suppliers relationships and, you know, Toyota sells a lot of cars. So <laughs> something seems to be working. Robert, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, we look forward to keeping an eye on both what Toyota is doing with electric vehicles and the supply chain. And so perhaps we'll have you on again in the future. But um, for today, that's been Transmissions. Thank you all for watching and listening.